welcome to our attendees that are on Zoom and to the people that are meeting in person over in the Hunter Conference Center. Um, I'm Jessica Kinsey, the Executive Director of Southern Utah Museum of Art, and really happy to be joined this evening by Shalee Cooper, the Director and Curator at Modern West Fine Art in Salt Lake City, um, and the one and only Billy Shank, um, the artist who is both featured here at SUMA and at Modern West. Um, so a little bit about the exhibition at SUMA, and then I'll have Shalee talk about um, the show there at Modern West. Um, and then we'll kind of jump in with some questions. Um, and for those of you that are on Zoom, uh, you can use the a chat feature um, to ask questions. And we've got a couple of people moderating those and we'll open up for questions from our audience later, later on. Um, so the exhibition here at SUMA um, is kind of two parts. Uh, we have Andy Warhol, Cowboys and Indians um, and Billy Shank, Myth of the West. Um, and these were both organized originally by the Briscoe Western Art Museum, which is in San Antonio. And I just happened to see that this was happening. And when I saw the name Billy Shank, I knew exactly who I could talk to about getting this show for SUMA and sent a text over to Diane Stewart um, there at Modern West. And within the hour I was being contacted by uh, by uh, the curator there at the Briscoe Museum. So um, it's been really fun to see this evolve and, and come together. And so you can see behind me, I'm, I'm sitting in the gallery. Um, I've got a few paintings uh, by Billy here. Um, so really excited to have his work um, at the museum, especially this time of year. Um, usually we have a faculty show or a regional high school exhibition. And it's so fun to have such a blockbuster exhibit um, in what's usually our off season. Uh, so thank you, Billy, and thank you, Modern West, for uh, being such a great partner in this endeavor. So Shalee, do you wanna talk a little bit about what's at Modern West? Definitely. For those of you that aren't familiar with Modern West, Diane Stewart started the gallery. It's been about eight years, I think. And originally her um, interest was to really bring works to Utah by contemporary artists who were, whose works really speak to the West. And obviously uh, Billy's work does that. Um, for those of you that aren't as familiar with Billy's work, he is iconic. I think it is such an honor for us to be featuring his body of work at the gallery where it's the first time he has ever done an exclusively landscape show. So if you're familiar with his work, there's a lot of pop reference and satirical commentary. And um, we were excited to see him kind of push what he normally does and do an entire body of work that was based off of his landscapes. Um, I think Billy, you're in what, 58 museum collections? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> and about 25 corporate collections. And yep. it's really incredible to be featuring a living artist who's um, so acknowledged. And in a way, we want to kind of push that and say, you know, how else can we feature Billy's work so that you can see the variety of what he does? So in this show, I think the work does that. And it's really compelling to see how his body of work has evolved and his process. So looking at sort of this paint by number uh, approach and then seeing in this body of work where he's blending his palette more so than you have seen probably in the, I, I would say the last decade, would you? Yeah. Would you really? <clears throat> yeah. So, I yeah. I think, you know, the thing is that you're always creating and you can see that with the piece behind you. You know, we got on and it was like, oh, you know, what's that, a new piece? He's always working, always pushing himself. And um, we're just honored to be featuring the work. And at the same time that the museum show is up, I think also something that's super interesting is that, Billy, you're also a collector. Yes. A sure. collector of art and of your own work and the works that are showing at the museum 
are yeah. actually all from your private collection. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So the the Warhol works are from the Briscoe, right. um, their their collection. Um, but all of the Billy work that you see here is from his personal collection. And I should have said, um, this is a retrospective um, and really spans six decades. So it's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then the works that we're showing is more recent work. So most of the work, Billy, is, was produced in 2020, 2021. There were right. just a few pieces that we curated and included um, that were earlier, but most of them were within the last year or so. So it's amazing to see the breadth of your work. And I love, Shali, that you've got Jack Rabbit Ridge behind you. Um, <laughs> I, I love telling people that I didn't realize how gullible I was until I met Billy Shank. I think that's because, you know, it's like, oh, you're the artist and you have this sense of authority and I can believe everything you say. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, and, and so to point out that the landscape show, one thing that's really cool is that he's using this technique and, and this way of kind of creating these new landscapes by taking, you know, a mesa from Canyonlands and a cottonwood tree from somewhere else and creating this mashup, if you will. Um, and so I remember when we were at the studio and he showed us this painting and said it's called Jack Rabbit Ridge. I thought of Jack Rabbit, Arizona, um, which is along Interstate 40. And so just asked, oh, where's Jack Rabbit Ridge? Well, it's nowhere because Billy made it up. So <laughs> um, so that's what you can find in several of those landscapes there at Modern West, which is really cool. So um, well, wonderful. Well, Billy, let's start by um, kind of the question that I've asked you lots of times. Um, but I'm so curious, you know, I, I said that this show spans six decades. You've obviously been an artist for a really long time, um, spent some time in New York City. How has the art world changed since you were a young um, artist? What, what's first, different? First, I've got to say, nobody's asked that question until this year. And boy, does it make me think, <clears throat> I mean, I have on occasion, you know, uh, reflected on that. It, as I've said earlier, when I first came to New York, that was 1970. Um, the entire contemporary world, by my estimate, consisted of around 350 artists, almost all of them located in New York City. And all the contemporary galleries were in New York with the exception of two on the West Coast. And there was nothing in between. So coming right out of art school and moving to New York in 1970, it was already very easy to follow, you know, these contemporary careers. You knew what artists were in each stable. Um, so, and, and I'd also say that um, historically, uh, um, the American audience um, that collected art really didn't start backing American artist until 1962, and that was with the advent of um, Leo Castelli and his stable of pop artists. And that was um, Warhol, Lichtenstein, uh, Rauschenberg, Johns, and there was a few others outside of that, Oldenburg, but the pop artist. And one of the uh, collectors who became a major entity at that time was Bob Skull, uh, who lived in New York City, and uh, he tried to buy the entire second show of Rauschenberg's, I think around 1959. And Leo Castelli wouldn't sell him the, uh, the entire show. He said, I have to be able to, you know, get other collectors involved. I need to get these things if it's possible in the museums, et cetera, et cetera. So other people did come on board. And by the early 70s, and after I had moved to New York, Bob Skull decided to sell his pop collection at Sotheby's, and that was around 1972 or 73. And he made an enormous profit uh, selling this work. And so that kind of justified, solidified, I don't know uh, all the right words, for the rest of the American public paying attention to pop to start slowly coming into the market. And as more people came into the market, 
of course, the market expanded. And then it exponentially expanded with artists as well. And then suddenly you saw galleries uh, pop up in different cities all over the Midwest, down in Texas and so forth until, um, uh, and in the Southwest. So that to move rapidly forward 50 years, uh, you know, whatever was 350 artists and a few of them were making a living at that time is exploded to, I, I don't know, I wouldn't even begin to know how many artists there are operating today. Maybe more than a million, maybe 2 million. There must be a few thousand galleries and um, art in general has now become, I don't know, for better and for worse, a commodity. Uh, and of course we have the advent of all these different auction houses. And so you can see a public record of, you know, what, what these careers are doing, how they're rising in the market value or, you know, settling out or disappearing. Uh, it's just, um, it's a huge new, totally different world. And I would also say way more competitive than what it was, uh, when I first went to New York, I've often speculated that if I had my same career with the exact same paintings and I tried to make it <laughs> in this era, I don't even know if I could, you know, get it off the ground. It's just, it's much more daunting a process now to yeah. become a yeah. successful artist. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a really good point and kind of a follow-up. Some of the things that came up in our conversations before was even just, like the role of a gallery um, does seem to be changing um, or for some artists, you know, trying to get that gallery representation or the role of social media in all of this. So um, yeah, it, it is a completely different art yeah. world, it, it seems, yeah. Yeah, I would say, for instance, uh, you know, when you went to New York and if you did get a gallery and that was such a huge deal to be able to get representation and then beyond that to even get a solo show. But when those galleries took you on at that time, they also managed you internationally or your entire career. You didn't have to do anything about getting any other representation. They got you in the group shows. They got you into museum shows. They got you representation in Europe if, if any of those avenues were available. After I left New York and I sort of had to relaunch my career um, with Elaine Horowitz, who was the uh, major entity in the Southwest uh, by the early 70s and mid 70s, it struck me right away, all she was interested in was the painting she represented to sell. There was no more interest for career that was left up to you as an artist. And it was also understood that if you wanted to expand to any other market, you had to do it on your own. So you were gonna have other dealers possibly, other gallery representation in other regions of the country. So you had to take on the business aspect of it you know, much more on a personal level. You had to take, you, know, you had to take uh, control of your own career. It wasn't going to happen yeah. for you. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you. Yep. Um, Shalee? I do think that as you were saying, like, oh, I don't know how I would even start, you know, my, uh, you know, career today if I were to take the same paintings. I do beg to differ because Billy, I think something about your work is that it is authentically yours. I that's think true. something that's very important about what it is you're doing is you have a voice and it is so distinct that it doesn't matter if it's a photograph or if it's a serigraph or if it's a painting. It's a Billy Shank work screams Billy Shank. So I, I have to say, um, in looking at your process, it's really interesting to, you know, Jessica had mentioned that uh, with the Jackrabbit Ridge, it's sort of this mashup of many different pieces. Right. Uh, one thing I wanted to just 
connect on is your process. I mean, you're out documenting, you have a concept about something and you're fabricating that concept in a way where you're photographing, getting ideas uh, on location. And then you come back to the studio and you're working with slides. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Yeah, what you're saying is true. Um, I, yeah, I, especially with the land, well, not just the landscapes, Pretty much everything I do, I create my own world, right. and, and in <laughs> and in that process, I photograph and I take trips out to Southern Utah once or twice um, a year. I've been doing that for fifty years, so I'm kind of intimately familiar with you know huge areas of uh, the, the Southwest or of Southern New Mexico, Southern Utah. <laughs> right, and, your favorite place on earth. It, it, right. <laughs> it's, so uh, what I do is I got, well, I have tens of thousands of slides and, and they're in loose leaf binders uh, and they're labeled according to genre and this and that. So in between paintings, if I'm kind of exhausted with painting in a particular day, say six, seven, eight hours, I might come back quite often for another couple of hours in the evening and just look at slides and I put things together that I think, oh, I like this object over here. Oh, I like this figure. Wow, this might look good with this landscape. And then I think specifically of a slide I might have taken, but it's in around 40 of these slide carousels, which hold 80 slides a piece. So that's, um, what is that, 332? A lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> so sometimes I get really frustrated because I've got such a specific idea in mind and I'm going through slide trays, carousels for maybe three hours or four hours looking for that specific slide. And in the process of that, I get distracted by finding other slides. I think, whoa, this might work. This is really good. So it's completely um, an insane process uh, to get to, you know, the first, the second, third, you know, the fifth or eighth slide that might get um, put together as a single yeah. image. To create and I that thing. one after another, and I project from foreground to background. And now, in some cases, I have to float um, a figure in, which I never used to do in the past, and get the scale. I hope right, because then I'm going to build the landscape, the skyscape, or whatever behind it. And I really don't know if all my proportions are right until I actually get the whole first coat of colors. So it can be a disaster if you've got. You know, it's just obvious to anybody if your proportions aren't correct. In this well, case. I love that you're utilizing this idea of collage as well. You're yeah. collaging all of this different yeah. imagery and creating this sort of reality. And yep. I think one thing that you mentioned to Jessica and I, when we had the amazing opportunity to visit you at the ranch, it was, I have to say, incredible to see your environment because you talk about this uh, feeling of almost of like being a man without a country. And, it, and part of that has to go with your work. It's like, where does it fall in alignment? Is it really Western art? Is it pop art? What is it? And seeing the life that you and Rebecca have created is almost that you've made this life of uh, an extension of your work in yeah. where you live and your studio and who you are. Um, but tell us a little bit about that balance of feeling like, you know, where do I belong as an artist? What? Well, I think that's both my strength and my nemesis is this unique style that I developed. And it was quite by accident. When I came to New York, I started projecting uh, imagery and drawing directly on the canvas like a photorealist. I mean, that, who, uh, that school of art was what I was attracted to. But I already also had, you know, this intimate kind of feeling about pop, particularly uh, Lichtenstein and Warhol. And so as I would draw these things, I also was reducing um, out a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. And then just building this into a paint by number system, um, I didn't realize that what I had done was marry pop, um, you know, the paint by number system to um, 
photorealism. And I came up with a style that uh, is, you know, very recognizable. So the world that I was in in New York, you know, was a contemporary world. But finally, they got um, I, they got tired of my romantic attachment to the Western subject matter. So I became sort of a you know an outcast, if you will, in the New York world. So then I come out and reestablish myself with the same work uh, in the Western market. But I was with Elaine Horowitz, and she was the champion of contemporary Western art. So I had a bit of a home there because I had also Luis Jimenez, who was a contemporary artist, and. T.C. Cannon, Fritz Scholder, uh, later Tom Palmore, John Fincher, and others came on board, Ed Mel. Um, so we built a niche that was definitely, we were the godfathers of contemporary Western art. But in the traditional Western market, which I also try to get involved with, you know, there's a degree of um, rejection, you know, from that group too. So. The uniqueness has helped me. I mean, it created a career that's been, you know, substantial, uh, lasting as long as it has. But you know, there's plenty of opportunities that don't present themselves for to one market or the other for whatever different reasons. But what I love about your work is that you have been um, true to the integrity of your work. Yeah. You haven't said, "Well, then I'm going to do this." you know, I'll, I'll try to jump on board in this way so that maybe I will be more received in that way. And I think something that's really amazing is that in a way, when I look at your work, I think, wow, you're so ahead of the curve. And, it, you know, it's like, oh, this, the process, when you think about it, it's like way before Photoshop, you know, <laughs> you're, you're shooting slides, <laughs> you know, you're thinking in, in ways, and now there's different tools that can be used in, in ways. And one thing that I loved hearing you say was that um, when you're out shooting, I asked, you know, do you ever consider shooting digitally? And you're like, no, it's too flat. You know, yeah. a digital image, it, a slide, there's so much more depth. And but the irony- capacity. Yeah, the luminosity. And what's interesting is then you pull that concept back to creating the work where it does go flat because you're doing right. this paint by number, but you understand the dimension and how to push the palette in a way where now you're blending and it does create more right. dimension. So I think it's it's great the way that you utilize the tools that you are that you're used to using. And for me to think of like, wow you know, that you were conceiving this way of seeing things before uh, it was so easy to, to mesh that and to be right. true to your process in the way that you're continuing to execute. Yeah. Yeah. It, one way I think of it is the challenge is using this system, which is, you know, pretty much a flat, you know, if you will, paint by number system to create the atmospheric. Yeah look of a French Impressionist from 1880. Right. <laughs> and that's a real challenge. <laughs> yeah. And going yeah. back to, um, you know, the digital photographs. Yeah, I don't want to work with, with, with something that's already flat. I want to be in control of what gets flat. I mm -hmm. want the luminosity to right. be the original inspiration. I don't want a smashed up flat right. digital image. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's a good point. Well, I think that that's something that you can, you've really captured in the show that we're featuring here is this, not only luminosity, some of the palette that you're using is so unexpected. Um, it, it's interesting because when we were visiting and I'm asking, well, how did you come up with this? And I, I want to move my computer so you can see some of, some of the other pieces in the show. Um, I've, we're working, I moved some of the lighting there. So, it was, but even this piece, and this was one of the earlier pieces, A Land Less Traveled, I think it's titled, Billy. But yeah. the palette is so unexpected. And I'm like, how did you even consider that? And you said it was really what you saw. Okay. Now, I don't know when you're being sarcastic always. So, <laughs> so is it what you, is it really what you saw? Well, yeah, I mean, that, I remember that specific location. It was, um, I was camping out. I was on the a dirt road on the way to uh, um, Height Landing, uh, which is north end of Lake Powell. 
And when I got up in the morning, the light was just hitting you know, these mesas on the far side, on the on the west side of um, you know the mesas at Lake Powell, and that was that landscape. But I did put in those trees, oh. and um, I just thought the light was perfect. If that's you, you know, and I also reference you know lots of other painters. Right. I mean, we'll get a situation where I think. Well, what would this look like if I put this, like in this case, you know, a yellow to green, lime green sky? And now I'll immediately go to my books and see who else has done anything that's similar to that to see how they resolve that situation. So, um, you know, I borrow and appropriate ideas, notions, and atmospheric stuff from everybody in the world, as I sometimes love to say. For those of you who are baseball fans, Leo DeRocher was a Hall of Fame, famous uh, manager back in the 40s and 50s. And he wrote a book titled, If You Ain't Cheating, You Ain't Trying. And I thought, yep, that's the right notion. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's pop art. It's, a pro you know, that's yeah. the definition of well, pop that, art is appropriation. Yeah. I mean, that's the paint by number system that I invented is really right out of pop culture. I mean, uh, the paint by number kits began to show up in the early 1950s. And so to use that concept, you know, to make a photo based image and to create as much realism while being reductive with your detail, I just took it to a whole different level. So uh, in all modesty, I'd like to say, I'm the best paint by number artist that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> I've just taken it to a further extreme than it was ever thought to have been when it was created. Well, so and I, I think that idea of um, artists that you're even borrowing from, like I think about this piece behind me, um, that cloud in the background um, just totally feels like Maynard Dixon. Um, yeah. Or even behind you, Billy, in the with the cowboy boot, you know, you can see that big right. that big cloud yeah, and. Right it just feels like Maynard Dixon. Um, so I think before we kind of go on uh, with another question, I just wanted to think about, you know, this idea of rejection and, um, and kind of that balance you have to strike between the two worlds, really. Um, right. It was interesting because I didn't realize until uh, you were here and we were visiting that you faced similar challenges in art school. Um, so it is really interesting, some of these things that have come back around. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can. It was, uh, I was in art school in Kansas City between 1967 and 1969. And I began using photographs um, in my first semester of uh, my senior year. And that would be in the spring of 1969. And... Um, the dean of the painting department, along with the seven instructors underneath him, or there were six of those, seven of him all together, in the painting and drawing classes, I, I, they got together and came up to my area uh, in the painting studio and said, you know, it's wrong to be using photographs uh, to make paintings. Why don't you work from real life? I didn't argue with him, but I was so depressed by that idea that I didn't paint the whole last semester before I graduated. I didn't realize those guys had shut me out. They had done the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be inspiring you to do, which is to continue, you know, being encouraging in, uh, in, in painting. And while I stopped painting, Ivan Karp came out to do a series of lectures that same spring. Um, from New York City, and he had been the director of the Leo Castelli Gallery. He was the guy who found all those pop artists and started that entire school of thinking. Well, now he was championing the cause of these photorealists. So he had slides of John Clem Clark, who became a mentor and a friend. He had um, Chuck Close mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the sculptor Dwayne Hansen. Um, and I just thought to myself, all of these guys are using photo projected imagery to create their paintings. And so I kept my mouth shut, like I said, for that last semester, I came back and then immediately went back to New York, got together with Ivan Karp, 
And so I could meet John Clem Clark. And then, then I started painting again using an opaque projector and then a slide projector, you know, to make that imagery. But boy, that was the wrong thing for those folks to do at Kansas City. And I don't know how many times I've actually heard that from other art students, you know, because I've had over the years, lots of uh, studio help and assistants, all who have gone through art schools and had their own personal experiences. Some of them very good, others where they stopped, you know, making art like I did for that, at least that five month period. But yeah, yeah, I do think um, when it comes to working from photographs, you're damned if you do, <laughs> damned yeah. if you don't sometimes. Absolutely. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, well, thank you. Um, I think to kind of wrap up uh, with our conversation before we open it up to questions, yeah. um, it's just thinking about like, what as an artist, have you learned, um, you've mentioned before, kind of these essential things uh, to, to being a successful artist or being an authentic artist. Um, so maybe just kind of talk about those and what advice you would have for well, current art students. One thing I have begun to preach over the last couple of decades is authenticity of intent. At least that's what I call it. I mean, if, if you are painting or making art specifically to fit a market, you know, to make a career, to make a living. I mean, it's kind of understandable to do that, but there's no authenticity to the work. That means go be a commercial artist, which is fine. Go be a graphic designer, be an illustrator, but that is not what a fine artist is by definition. Secondly, um, you do have to have a voice and that's proven by all the art history, you know, we study everything, you know, for the last 500 years of Western European culture, all those artists that we study all have signature styles. And the third thing, especially now in this era with so many talented people, you know, trying to launch careers, you need perseverance. Like, I mean, maybe that's always been true because you're going to get rejection. You have to have an unbelievable faith in your own work. You just have to. And the flip side is you can be delusional and think what you're doing is great when actually it's not. So that's a tricky, slippery slope. Yeah, I think some delusion might be healthy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, and I, you know, one thing that sort of resonated, uh, we had an artist do a visit in 2018. Um, and he's in his mid to late 70s. And I remember taking him to one of the classes and one of the students asked, what motivates you? And this artist was just sort of dumbfounded because honestly, motivation isn't part of his vocabulary. Mm -hmm. He just lives and breathes his right. work. And I think you're really similar to where yeah. this is just who you are. Yep. Um, so that perseverance comes naturally. Yep. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, the question of what motivates you, I think yeah. doesn't apply because, yeah. No, I am actually an extremely stubborn person. And I'll tell you, like galleries, they will sometimes say, well, you know, the, mar the clients like this or they want that. And you've got to paint what they like. And I'm saying, no, you paint what you want. And you've been the collectors to start believing in what it is you do. You change the collectors, not the artist. And that's something I've held on to forever. You know, yeah. knowing for, like the caption paintings, for instance, and you have some in that show. I started doing those decades ago and I knew nobody was going to be interested in buying those things. It was just too different. Uh, there's one back there, there's two of them. Uh, you know, in the Western art world. Um, but I just kept doing them and I still do. And now finally, you know, they've caught on. Uh, and now people who even actually, you know, ask, uh, you know, to see what new caption paintings I might be doing. So all it did was take 30 years of perseverance, pounding people over the head and saying, this is legitimate, buy it. It's okay. It's radical, but it's okay. <laughs> so. That's the yeah. thing we are talking about being ahead of the curve. And I'm going to just put a little plug in that you might want to stay tuned for what's next at Modern West online exclusive, speaking of caption paintings, but that's all I'm gonna say. 
Um, well, uh, I'll go ahead and um, open it up for questions um, for the people that are there together in the Hunter Conference Center. I haven't seen any pop up yet um, on Zoom. Um, but for Alana and Emily from the SUMA team that are there, uh, do you have questions for Billy? If not, I have a couple of backups. Hi. Okay. Hey, we do have one question from our audience. Um, if you want to come up, you can ask directly that way. I was just curious, what was the reasoning for adding the Al Capone piece? Because it's a little bit different than the rest of the modern West art there. That's true. Cause... It is. Um, I don't know how that got included. I was glad that it was. But I have uh, a, almost 80 paintings in my personal collection uh, going all the way back to 1971. And they, uh, they represent every era and genre that I've... Um, you know, messed with over the years. And I just, I just probably put that in front of the uh, curator's face and said, oh man, let's include this, you know, even though it wasn't Western. I like, the, I mean, the notion of, you know, Al Capone patented the drive-by shooting. I mean, I like the idea. I mean, that's, I like the wordsmithing that goes into that process. Uh, Cause of course nobody patents, you know, a drive-by shooting, but he was the first, you know, 1928 or whatever. So I was just glad that that did get included. I'm also painting okay. surfing girls and we don't have any of those, you know, in the show. But so there's other things that I've done over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and that's for the movie. So you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just, I think that's a good um, kind of reminder of um, that the Briscoe Museum are the ones who curated this retrospective um, based on available works from Billy's collection. Um, and so that's where, yeah, a lot of this is coming from. There's one piece in Suma's show that wasn't part of the traveling show, which is um, a oh, yeah. painting of Kachina, a Kachina yeah. doll. Um, so that was a fun experience uh, being at Billy's um, home uh, getting a tour and walking into this room and there's Kachina dolls on the fireplace and there's this painting of a Kachina doll. And I said, why isn't this in the show? <laughs> Andy Warhol has, has a work of Kachina dolls and he kind of, you're right, it should be. Yeah, um, right. And so here it is. So that was very validating for me. <laughs> um, but uh, so we do have a question um, in our Q&A. So I'll just read it, Billy, and, and you okay. can respond. Um, first, the person, uh, Steve says, thanks for, thanks so much for being here. Uh, do you draw any inspiration from anything in Western literature, either historical or fiction? Mm -hmm. And he gives the example, Tony Hillerman, which I think is a, yeah. a really good example. Um, could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, not directly, but I have read, I think almost all the Tony Hillerman books, um, Zane Gray, I've read, um, Carmack McCarthy, um, oh gosh, the guy, Lonesome Dove, um, I can't think of mm. his name, but no, specifically, I mean, I love reading that literature, but it doesn't really give me um, visual inspiration, it's just, you know, the essence of what they do, I, no, I'm much more directly uh, inspired originally by the black and white movie stills, uh, or even color movie stills, um, because I have such a, I, I think, a cinematic approach uh, to the way I build imagery. I really pay attention to where the camera is angled, where it's in all scenes. I will, uh, if you will, deconstruct Western films, and not just Western, all film noir, all that kind of stuff. I want to understand, you know, the wording, the dialogue. The, the location shooting, the angles, uh, just um, that stuff is much more directly uh, inspirational to me. And I do read as much Western literature as is being written. It's just not a direct impact on the work. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 
Um, I do really like Tony Hillerman's work. I need to read more. I only read a couple of books. Um, so I'll kind of ask this, uh, what's your favorite Western movie? Uh, <laughs> um, for about 50 years, it was uh, The Good and the Bad, The Ugly. Uh, and there's, uh, there's plenty more. The Searchers, John Ford, um, Red River. Uh, I like telling Willie Boys here. Um, the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. Uh, I could go on and on and on. There's just, <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah. And I visit and, them <laughs> constantly. Yeah. And this painting behind me, um, that's a movie still, right? It is. But you use, yes. What movie is that from? That was Colorado. I get that question a lot. Do you? That was from Colorado Territory. And that's um, Virginia Mayo and Joel McRae. And Joel McRae is, uh, you know, considered to be actor. But I'll tell you one thing I love about Joel McRae, and this is something I pay attention to in the Western films. That guy knows how to ride a horse. And Virginia Mayo was one of the sexiest women that's ever been on screen in a Western. So this is the last scene, just before the last scene of that film. And I think it was 1946 that it was filmed and some of it in uh, Canyon de Chez. Mm. And he's an outlaw on the run and she is um, in love with this desperado. And at the very last scene, he is trapped in a cliff dwelling and the posse is out there and he is holed up and she is with the posse and they, and but not on their side. And as soon as somebody's not looking, she grabs a gun and gets uh, Joel McRae out of the cliff dwelling and sits there and starts blasting away at the posse and they both get shot to pieces. This was the movie that was totally influ uh, that became influential to Bonnie and Clyde from 1968, mm -hmm. another 22 years later. Well, anyway, so this scene, you know, of Embrace, I titled it the last sunset, because in the in the movie, it was their last sunset. <laughs> so it was this, you know, my tongue in cheek metaphor. So that's how that came to be. Yeah, great. Do we have other questions there with our live audience? I'm not seeing any on Zoom. Or Shalee, if you have any follow up I say, questions. Um, I wanted to see if Scout was getting any questions. We're also filming this oh, right. um, so that we have a live feed. Okay. So, yeah, right. I think um, I would say what's next on your radar, Billy. I mean, you're always producing. What are you working on currently? Well, if I, okay, I'm going to point. The, can you see there? Okay, this is a new series and I'm titling it boots on the ground, you know, which is a military cliche. And I started photographing these things decades ago. And I did a half tone dot painting that somehow got destroyed before it ever got anywhere. But this is the first um, in that series. And then I also photographed uh, Rebecca, my partner with, um, she's got a new pair of pink boots made by Rocket Buster in El Paso. And so she's in the next painting. So this is going to be a new series um, that I'm working on. And it's just going to be boots on the ground. One, two, three, I six, love seven, eight. And I like cool. the perspective. You know, this is like, this is per, per, per Sergio Leone. The mm -hmm. camera's right on the ground. And you've got these outsized boots and up to the knees. And then mm -hmm. the landscape in the back. I mean, you don't see Western art that looks like that. <laughs> right. No, yeah. good. excellent point. I think you can say that about the bulk of your work. Right. Um, <laughs> it is, it's Billy Shank. Um, right. Well, we don't have any other questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and say thank you to Billy um, and Shalee for both taking the time this evening to join us on Zoom and talk about the two shows. It's been such a fun partnership that's been growing between the museum and the gallery um, and just such a delight to be able to meet and work with Billy. Um, if you haven't been, uh, the show at Modern West 
is up through March 11th. Um, and the show here at SUMA is open through March 19th. And I will make a little plug that we are open for President's Day weekend. So we'll be open this Sunday from one to five and open regular business hours on Monday. So if you wanna use the holiday weekend and come see the exhibition, it's a great opportunity. So thank you to uh, the staff um, on SUMA side, Emily and Alana, Modern West. I know that Peter and Scout were uh, instrumental in helping make sure that this worked smoothly. So thanks to the team um, and thanks to our audience for being here. Thank you, Jessica. I just want to quickly also thank Diane Stewart for her support in Billy's work and us being able to feature the work at the same time at the museum. It has been an amazing collaboration and to be able to market such different bodies of work to such a wide audience so that everyone could really experience the um, breadth of Billy's work has been amazing. And we look forward to many more collaborations. And I wanna thank you two for your support. It, it, this is something like I've not experienced in my career. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> we are happy to be on Team Billy. Yes. <laughs> it's been All such right. a joy. Thank okay, you. Well, thank you. Yay. Thank you. Okay. Take care and we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Bye. Bye. Bye.